Uh, good morning and welcome to the Royal Society. I'm Alex Halliday. I'm the physical secretary here, uh, one of the vice presidents. Um, I'm a, my main paid job is to be a professor at Oxford in geochemistry. I know very little about the Internet of Things, and yet I know, like most people, tons about it because it affects and pervades everybody's lives these days. Um, the Royal Society has a, um, long been uh, an advocate for blue skies research, and in particular for in things that are actually at the real pinnacle of discovery and scientific excellence. But if you were here about 150 years ago, you would have also found tons of people from industry and business. In fact, the majority of people were not actually scientists. So um, a few years ago, it was agreed that it was a, would be a good idea to rebuild some of this lost um, heritage of the Royal Society and actually get ourselves more involved in the key issues of future technologies and uh, industry and business today. So with that in mind, we set up a program which is all about uh, industry and technology and translation. It's chaired by um, Simon Campbell and Herman Hauser, uh, and it's actually been incredibly successful, uh, as well as this transforming uh, our futures thing. We also have a number of other things, including giving out medals and awards and funding for people who've come up with exciting new um, ideas for spin-outs, etc. So um, transforming our futures has been really, really important. We've been looking at a number of big, exciting new technologies, of course, battery technologies, a variety of things in information, things in genetics, etc. And the one on the Internet of Things is one of those things that we actually need to sort of think about, not just because it's an exciting new technology where the UK potentially can actually play a leading role in terms of its um, science and its uh, development of new companies. It's also something that we need to think about in terms of being a risk and something which actually we need to understand how it's going to pervade our lives. So this is a really important meeting. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing what happens today. Uh, my role is basically just to welcome you here. Hope you have a really good time. Uh, one of the things we always insist on is uh, good discussion. So we expect you to think of tough questions and don't hold back. And we don't actually want people to all agree with each other. We want people to debate the, the main issues and be forthright in their views. And that's one of the things we look forward to in this meeting as well as others. And without any further ado, I'll hand over to Wendy Hall, who's going to introduce today's meeting. Thank you very much, Alex. Well, it's a pleasure to see you all here today. This has been in the planning for a while, and uh, more people will arrive. I'm sure we have a sellout audience today. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points before we start about why this was so important. For the last 27, 30 years or so, 27 years since the web emerged, we've had this two-dimensional society meets technology uh, interesting ev evolution. Um, and that's what my research at Southampton is all about, social machines. But the, um, it started off all as a, you know, this was, we all thought this was a great force for good. Uh, and it is. I mean, for all the right the reasons that the founders of the internet and the web uh, thought about. Sharing information, the democratisation of knowledge, helping people understand more about the world they live in, and main part of co-creating that world with the technology. But over the last few years, we've seen many downsides to this invention. And it's, uh, you know, just think about um, the internet and democracy and how we know now fairly clearly that how um, the, inter the, the web and the internet were used, social media was used in the last US presidential election. And uh, the whole issue of fake news, there was another story of the awful events in Las Vegas last night where there was a fake news story whistled around on Google about the wrong person being the shooter. And it's really difficult to disentangle what's real and what's fake. Huge issues about cyber security, which are a wave that's um, going to continue and we're all going to have to be constantly aware of, both on a personal and a national and an international level. And uh, fragmentation of things. I've just come back from China, where the internet is huge. There's billions of people using it. I joined WeChat. I'm now on WeChat with billions of China. Of course, I can't understand most of what they're saying. Um, and it's sort of fun to be on the edges of that network. But it's a totally different... They love being on social media, but it's a completely different um, 
world in that they're quite enclosed compared to us where we, we, um, we like to think we have access to everything around the world. And now we're about to add a third dimension, uh, the Internet of Things, which has been talked about, promised, the whole ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing, smaller and smaller devices that may have varying degrees of intelligence on them or we don't know what on them, that is about to hit the market in a way that is, at the moment, fairly unregulated and has not been thought about in terms of the type of ecosystem that's going to be created. There are clearly huge opportunities with this technology, but there are also major threats to society, and we need to be cognizant of what's happened current, uh, with the first-generation internet, if you want to call it that, or second-generation with the web. We need to be cognizant of what can go wrong in order, I think, to be more, pr more uh, uh, f careful as we go forward about issues that might be dangerous to society and what type of society we want to build with this and, of course, with the coming reinvention of AI, uh, the fourth wave of AI, which links all this to robotics and, uh, and the whole world of intelligent systems and machines that do things that are far cleverer than we can do in many aspects. So before I introduce our keynote speaker, I know we had to address a lot of this, I want to give a big thanks to my co-chairs, well, firstly to the Royal Society for hosting this event, which I think is a very exciting and timely event, to all the people that help. But I also want to give a shout out for my co-chairs, Patricia Lewis uh, from Chatham House and Jeremy Silver from Digital Catapult and Jeremy Watson from UCL and the Petrus uh, IoT Hub. Uh, we've worked together on this, and one thing we have achieved pretty much is a, a diverse uh, set of participants. And actually, if you look at the audience, it's not too bad. For a technical topic, uh, we've got a pretty diverse group of people in the audience, which is absolutely fantastic. And it shows that with, there are all sorts of people out there that have, are great experts in these technical areas, and it's so important that we aren't just talking to one type of audience, that we're talking to society helping explain the technology and considering those opportunities and threats. So, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Hugh Durant-White as the keynote speaker. He's the current CSA, Chief Scientific Advisor to the MOD, Ministry of Defence. If you do anything with the MOD, you understand you have to speak totally in acronyms. So he's the CSA MOD. Um, and uh, uh, luckily for the UK, we have a... Maybe not luckily, maybe it's exactly what the, the committee were seeking to appoint. We have uh, a person in that role who really gets this world, which is so important for uh, the MOD and other government departments and, and industry going forward. I asked him what his title was. He said, oh, I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things. So Hugh Durant-White, the Internet of Things, thank you. <laughs> I should have said Professor and FRS, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I thought actually what I would do is I'd talk about opportunities as business opportunities, and I'm going to actually pick up on some work I did last year, uh, really looking at the rollout of the Internet of Things in the mining industry, and try and give you a sense of the scale of the opportunity and the kinds of issues that I think people are addressing. And then when we get to the threats part, actually I've converted them more into challenges rather than threats. I always like to think positively about these things. And for me, I think there are two significant technical challenges that we have. And I'm actually going to do a couple of deep dives, one into uh, the whole data area and one into privacy. And I think both of these are kind of critical for the future of the Internet of Things. So I think first up, and when we think of IoT, we think of devices and things like that. But to be honest, it's got very little to do with devices in my view. It's all to do with data. It's uh, when you get the data out of a network in some kind of form, what do you do with it and how do you make money out of it uh, and how do you use it for some useful purpose. And those are really the challenges in IoT. It's got, truthfully in my view, very little to do with actually building physical uh, devices. And the other thing I think that's important to point out, and you'll see in a lot of my slides, IoT has actually been around for at least 30 years. It's just that we called it different things, right? We had network sensing, we had the industrial internet, uh, we had lots and lots of devices all networked 30 years ago. Um, there is, however, I think some changes that are about to happen. And uh, I don't know whether you've seen the Gartner hype curves or you follow it, but IoT is currently near the peak, that it is one of the most hyped technologies around and has yet to really actually deliver anything at all. However, having said that, What's critical, I think, about IoT, and it comes from the obvious bit of the name, Internet, is that the possibility of using some standards. 
all right, which means that actually lots of people can get involved. Lots of different devices, um, you know, bar lowering the barrier for entry for lots of different companies to be involved uh, in this area. Uh, the quality of the kinds of platforms and the ideas for linking those pieces of information together. And I will also say the coming of age, I think, of uh, machine learning, analytics, AI, to actually do something useful with the data and really get some outcomes. So I think after perhaps 30 years of gestation, IoT potentially is indeed at a tipping point now. And I hope to kind of show you that in some of the examples uh, that I'm using. So the real business proposition, in my view, for IoT, and just as much of an academic, I'm a business person in the end, it's about the fact that we could get standard, open, and reusable systems, all right? And that's really what will change things, as opposed to the sort of proprietary networks that have been uh, done in the past. So you can kind of imagine the business proposition for startups and even for bigger companies. An open market for sensors and actuators, lots of people providing them against different kinds of standards. An open market for data, and we do need to manage privacy and security and everything else, but the idea that you can generate data for one application and reuse it for another and put it into a third and everything else is, is really one of the driving things, I think, behind IoT. And then fundamentally, in the end, no one's going to buy this thing unless it does something to change the way they live their lives or run their business or anything like that. And we actually have to figure out how we actually apply IoT to actually solve those sorts of problems. And I'm going to look at one of those in detail in a minute. So I think it really is important that we think of IoT in terms of those kinds of uh, things, because if we don't get these standards right, we'll never really build an industry out of it. So like I said, I'm going to do, instead of doing generic stuff in this talk, I'm going to actually take effectively three deep dives. I'm going to talk about one in business and two in technology. So the business one for me is actually based on a study that I did about a year ago, but I have a long, long background in the mining industry. Um, but it really is the area where people are investing hugely in this, not just mining, but the resources, oil and gas sector as well. So this is typically what's going on in the mining industry at the moment. It is one of the most sophisticated industries uh, imaginable. So these mines now are completely automated. You see that truck has no driver in. There are more unmanned uh, vehicles driving around in Australia doing mining than there are in all the US. It's just that we don't talk about them too much, all right? So there are 300 mines owned by 300 tr automated vehicles just owned by this one company in, the, in, the, in Australia at the moment. And these mines have been operating now for about seven or eight years. So it's not like they're even new technology. And of course, there's a huge opportunity. You look at these sorts of things here for sensors, geological sensors, vehicle sensors, people monitoring, uh, process monitoring, and everything else. It's just an enormous opportunity for gathering information together and really trying to drive the efficiency and the productivity of these sorts of operations. Uh, when you look at how this thing is set up now, and I find this picture interesting, this is the, uh, uh, this is the ROC, the so-called Remote Operations Centre that Rio Tinto run near Perth Airport. It actually runs 15 mines across the world, uh, mines that are in Mongolia, that are in the US, that are in Australia, all from one place. And all the sensor data is collected together, presented and run, and the data is shared between different mines, so better productivity is over here, how can we exploit it here and so on. So the mining industry is, and you know why they're doing it, because it makes money. That's why it has a good business proposition, all right? And that's why it makes sense. And the oil industry are pretty much in the same game uh, in this area as well. So let's look at the IoT area here. Uh, and a couple of things I'll kind of want to point out. This is my picture over here of IoT in the mining industry. And it's got what I always think of as the nouns along the top. Sensors, networks, platforms, analytics, automation. The kinds of things that we as technologists want to build. And down the side here, we've got what I think of as the verbs, which is what we use them for. So driving efficiency, producing safe systems, doing maintenance, producing quality material, and so on. And each of those kind of plays a role in here. And really what you want to do is when you go out and, for example, build a safety system, you want to choose sensors, networks, and various different pieces to make safety work. But you'd also like to reuse those sensors to do maintenance, to do other things. Do you see what I mean? And that's the kind of IoT proposition that you, that you have out there. So if you kind of study this, and this is not, this fits actually pretty closely with, uh, there was a McKinsey's report uh, about four or five years ago into, into IoT in general, but these are basically the numbers that we produced. The value of basically IoT to the mining industry is of order about 200 to 800 billion a year, all right, between now and 2025. So it really is a major kind of thing. But the important thing is this piece down here. 90% of the value of IoT is not in building devices or networks or platforms or anything. It's actually in the fact that you've got data and you use it to drive a much more efficient operation. All right, much safer, more automated, efficient process. And actually, the more I look at different applications, the more I realize 
um, that the IoT, there's, no, there's, there's not going to be nearly as much value add in actually just building devices and systems and so on. The real value add is how that information is actually used to change the way people do business in a different, more efficient way. All right? And I think, in truth, we see that in the internet thing. It's not, you know, you don't make money out of routers anymore. You make money out of how you use the internet to build a business. All right? That's a completely different prospect. And again, I think, for few, I think that's going to be the future in IoT as well. So there's lots of stuff that's out there. Uh, these are typical sorts of things. This is a, uh, a drill ship. This is a gold processing plant. This is a place in Papua New Guinea I occasionally visit. Uh, you know, not just for doing the technology, but all the kind of applications. I put on here some of the kind of opportunities, and I wrote a whole report on basically where you could make money with IoT in the resources space. And yes, you can make money out of IoT components, and actually we proposed to the government that they set up what we call a living lab. Uh, that is a lab where lots of different vendors could bring together sensors and products and actually try them and check that all those standards and interfaces really worked. And perhaps also explain to industry uh, how IoT could really benefit from what they're doing. But the real payoffs in the end, we're using those sorts of data to do equipment monitoring, to do optimization. Safety was an enormous issue. So uh, you look at the kinds of way these things are operated, simply being able to track people and things that are moving around in the environment and use that in some kind of way to promote safety and the, the use of uh, people and equipment and so on is critical. Uh, geological systems, so there's an awful lot of really good stuff going on in distributed geological sensing, uh, and I think that'll really change the way that we do sort of geology and uh, materials exploitation and so on. There are site-wide systems, as you saw, there's automation, there are enormous amounts of different business opportunities for really exploiting IoT in a big, in a big way. So when you look at what's going on in Australia and you try and actually compute, well, you know, if I started a company in building sensors or networks for IoT, there's of order of magnitude about a $50 billion business uh, in Australia, which is significant, okay? Based on 200 sites of order one to two million IoT devices, uh, that sort of thing. And furthermore, you know, if you like, you can really make the business case. That is, you can get companies to actually invest in doing this kind of process. So I think it's also beholden to us to kind of look logically and clear-mindedly at other application domains and really try and figure out what is the business proposition, okay? How are we actually going to take this technology and sell it in some kind of way, rather than frankly just talking rather generically about what IoT could or might do. The other thing that's become very, very clear is uh, that device companies at the moment are very, very immature. So that what, one thing that they do not do is really layer themselves in the way that a mature industry does. So for example, what happens is you get an IoT company and not only do they build the devices, but they build the platform, they build the algorithms, and they try and vertically stack the technology st uh, uh, in thing. Whereas in fact, what we really want to do, which is what happens in the internet space, is someone builds the platform, someone builds the interface layer, and then different people build the different kinds of applications. So one of the big things, which is interesting, that's happening in the mining industry now, is to try and separate out those functions. So, you know, the idea that you actually get different people to build an IoT network, that you get someone else, and this is really an evolving thing now, to really build what amounts to a data platform which can engage with IoT specifically for the mining industry, what people are now calling mining as a service, you know, in terms of platform as a service. And then someone else goes out there and builds apps around resource planning, maintenance, safety, optimization, and that kind of thing. And the other big thing that I think is important and perhaps germane to other businesses in the IoT space is that what's happening is the mining industry is actually driving the standards. It's not the device companies. All right? In some sense, it's against every device company's interests to make themselves compatible with anyone else. Do you understand what I mean? So uh, people have not so far really come up with the right standards. There are IEEE standards and things like that, but relatively few people actually adhere to them. Whereas it's a clearly in the business interests of the user to make sure that it has many different vendors supplying to it. You see what I mean? So the mining industry is actually doing its utmost and is succeeding, I think, in really driving open standards and open platforms and things like that with the goal, basically, of really building an ecosystem, particularly in the analytics space, of how you integrate devices and different applications uh, and these sorts of things. So in many senses, the mining industry is probably more advanced in its business thinking that a lot of other sectors, and the real reason in the end is there's so much money to be made if you get this right, okay? And they, if there's one thing mining companies know how to do, it's count money. Uh, so that's my kind of business deep dive, and I hope that sort of set the sort of platform for the kind of opportunities that we have in a business sense in IoT. The other two things that I want to talk about were some of the challenges, uh, and um, 
uh, you know, there are a number of them, but I would put uh, two of them really up there. The first one is, one thing you see that's often very missing in the whole IoT space is what I talk of as the data fusion problem, which is, given all these devices, how you actually put all the information together to actually make some sense and make some decisions and these sorts of things. And, and, and I have to be honest, I think that's arguably the, the most significant technical challenge that we have uh, in building very large-scale networks. I think the other one that I find very, very interesting, I know less about, but I have been involved in, is this whole idea of privacy. And I distinguish privacy in this case from things like security. Privacy basically says I do need to give you information, but I should choose how I give it to you and when I give it to you and what you use it for. All right? So it's not a question of not giving anybody anything. It's a question of how that's sort of managed. So I really wanted to ping out, put out these, you know, in the spirit of what we heard at the beginning, pull out these two things really as a spot ideas for discussion. All right? It's not the only technical issues in IoT, but I think they're some of the critical ones. So just to show you that IoT is old, this is my old lab in Oxford, uh, circa late 1980s, early 1990s, all right? Uh, and you can see networks, IoT networks that we had in the lab at the time. This is a slightly bizarre robot. You can see it's all made of different boxes and different sensors. And although we didn't have Wi-Fi, they're all basically connected together. Can you see that? And there is actually no central computer here. So it's kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer network data fusion kind of problem. And it was this idea that you could build modular standard bits of robots and join them together. All right, and I'll point out again, this was late 1980s, early 1990s, right? Uh, no one really thought this was a good idea at the time. And also, in our bathroom in, uh, in, in, uh, 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 in the engineering building, we built this huge network of sensors that monitored a big process control plant. And we looked at problems basically to do, again, for those shows you how old it is, this is a transputer-based system, OK? Uh, which actually, transputers are ideal for IoT. It's a shame, shame I didn't keep them all. Uh, uh, but basically, it allowed you to basically connect networks together and try and do this data fusion, fault detection, you know, really try and exploit this, uh, this sort of technology. Whoops, I clearly clicked the wrong button. Uh, so uh, what we learned from that was there are actually quite some quite good algorithms out there for building data fusion in networks. That is how you put information together from different parts. And without wanting to go into the algorithmic details, it turns out there's a whole area of information theory that allows you to basically do peer-to-peer -peer data fusion without any central processing and really operate and how you put information together in these sort of large-scale networks. And we took that idea and we actually got BA Systems to fund a fairly major demonstrator when I went out to Australia which involved flying multiple, this is again about 2001, 2003, that sort of period. And we built these UAVs, you can see here. And you can see the UAVs have got funny noses, and they basically, they're plug and play sensors. So the idea is you would take one sensor in a package, you'd plug in a different one, you'd be able to network them, you'd be able to fuse the data, do you see what I mean? It's basically IoT, we just didn't know the word at the time. Uh, and to demonstrate that you really could do data fusion and networks and so on. So the big advantage of being in Australia to do this is we owned our own flight test facility and you can fly lots of things like that. In fact, we, it was about uh, 20,000 hectares, so you can sort of do this kind of stuff. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we did a lot of work trying to understand uh, particular issues like how, what happens when the network doesn't communicate all the time. How do you then exchange information? How do you fuse it? How do you worry about network resilience? You'll see up here, you know, sometimes the vehicles communicate, sometimes they don't. Uh, how you would basically integrate different types of sensors, how you would do things like making decisions in networks uh, like this, and all this sort of thing. I have to say, it was just too far ahead of its time. No one was really, I mean, people were only just getting into UAVs at the time, let alone networks of, of UAVs uh, for doing this kind of thing. But nevertheless, it demonstrated the kinds of algorithms that you could produce. One thing we did learn, and I think this plays into AI 4.0, is uh, one of the key technologies that maps onto this is this kind of idea of doing graphical models. So a very good mathematical model for IoT is actually all this work that's done on graphical models in AI. I don't know how, how many people are familiar with that, but that really does talk about probability distributions, how you pass probability distributions over networks as parts of messages, how you integrate those messages and everything else. And there's lots of very, very good theory for doing this, and it turns out you can build a lot of interesting data fusion algorithms, particularly ones that are non-standard. So you know, probabilities on identity, uh, standard machine learning algorithms can all be mapped to a typical IoT structure. And I will say, I stopped working at it in this, at this point, but uh, I think there's a whole huge research area out there about how machine learning methods actually map to networks uh, like IoT. And I, I think that would be a really productive area for research. And this just shows you yet another demonstration of airborne and ground-based systems that we use to basically demonstrate that. 
So I think the data fusion area is something that is out there now. This is more the sort of things I used to be doing when I left Sydney. Uh, same IoT thing. In fact, we've got, you can see, instrumented cows here, and we track the cows in motion. Uh, we also have a robotic milking. So basically, we know exactly the yields. And in fact, what happens is the cows self-milk. They choose to come into the milker, OK? And then they get milked, and then they go out and they get a reward, which is how come you can train them, OK? And then you can use that. You know exactly where they are when they, drink, when they eat the grass, so you know how the grass depends on it. You know exactly what you have to give them in extra grain, all right, in order to maximize yield. And you've got all the weather. You have basically have everything you want. And you can really actually build some really interesting machine learning algorithms that work on these kinds of networks. So let me talk about the second part of what I wanted to say. So I've got about five minutes, I think. Uh, I got into privacy preserving stuff, or privacy, when I, uh, for many, many years, I've only owned, owned a phone for about two years, and I object to the fact that people can track me and take my data and everything else. And um, I was very interested in, in, in systems that basically prevented people doing that. And it turns out there are lots of really good ideas out there. And I'll come to, I think this year has actually seen a real pivot in where privacy is going, and I'll talk about that in the next overhead. But it turns out there are some interesting algorithms around now that really say, OK, I don't actually need to give the data to anyone. I can create a private data store. This is the MIT one, incidentally. The uh, Media Lab has this system called Pandora that allows you to build your own personal data store and then selectively decide which pieces of information you provide. Or alternatively, which I think is really interesting, is you don't ever provide data, but you allow people to download analytics that can operate on your data and return a result. All right, and I think this is really, really interesting technology because it completely changes things around. And when you think about the IoT space, you can imagine this now where devices never actually give away their data. They keep the data. And what you do in the network algorithms that I've just showed you is you actually download the analytics to the device. It does the processing and comes back with the result. Do you see what I mean? And in fact, you never see the data at all. So that would be privacy rather than security, if you see what I mean. And we developed a bunch of algorithms based on what's called homomorphic encryption. I don't know whether people have come across this, but it's basically a type of encryption that allows you to exchange encryption with mathematics. So the mathematical operators and the encryption are exchangeable. Okay? And what that really means in the end is that you can basically do mathematics on encrypted numbers and end up with the result, but in an encrypted form. So you can do calculations with, without ever actually seeing the data at all. Uh, and you can do it in partial form. So now the technology in this area has, has I mean, when we were doing this, it was, it was very fearsomely complex to do. But actually, even in the last two or three years, the complexity of this problem, people have worked at it, has come down substantially. All right? And I think it's really interesting. We developed some very interesting applications. So this is actually a, a calculation for wayfaring dose, which is what you have when, you, you know, uh, when you've got heart, heart issues. And what this shows is my phone that basically has my genome on it, which I had sequenced for this purpose. This actually has uh, the particular drug company's algorithm. And both of these things are confidential. Okay? And yet I can take the confidential algorithm, apply it to the confidential data, and end up with an answer without ever seeing either of them. Okay? This is the kind of thing I think that will really change what's going on in, in the Internet of Things privacy area. And then I had a, a, one of my colleagues came over a couple of weeks ago to tell us about his startup company that's in this space. And I will say the number of companies that have spun out in the last year that are all doing privacy now, not security, all right, that are using these things. This is one of the best ones, the encrypted veil, never decrypt, powered by homomorphic encryption. You can download the app, okay, and everything else, and you, you basically can do all these calculations and never see the data. So I think this is a really interesting area because it means, in the end, not just for IoT, but people will end up being able to own their data, which I think will be interesting because I think, actually, uh, it has the potential to disrupt the standard data business model that Google and Facebook run. So disinvest now, guys. <laughs> so just trying to stop on time here. Uh, my thing about IoT, I think, is this value proposition. Standards, open, reusable, and I do think the driver is going to be the application. So I think we've got to start talking about specific demonstrations where we can actually demonstrate there will be value add when it's done, because they, in the end, are going to be the people who are actually going to drive progress, I think, in this area. I think the key challenges that we're going to face as a research community in IoT is actually not about building devices at all. It's going to be about data and the way we use data and the way we use it to generate a decent outcome in this thing. So the data fusion and the privacy area. And I will grind to a halt there. Thank you. <laughs> well,
Right, while we've got you here, yep. let's have a few questions. You've brilliantly timed. That was a fantastic opener for this morning. OK, have we got mics? I have a mic. No, not you, the audience. <laughs> God dear me. Ah, yes, right. Questions for Hugh. Come on, wake up, everybody. Yes. Uh, sis, I, say who you are and where you're from. I know this lady. She's come all the way from Washington for this event. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Dinardis with American University in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your talk. I was very interested in what you had to say about the possibility of open standards and improving the interoperability mm -hmm. of IoT. But at the same time, there seems to be not as much of a market incentive to have the same kind of interoperability. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the prospects for that kind of layered interoperability, what the potential market incentives can be, and what standard setting institutions are the ones that we can look to for leadership in that area. Thank you. There are lots and lots of IoT standards bodies out there. In fact, when I did this survey, I attempted to find out what the standards were and came up with a list of 24 different standards bodies for IoT alone, including IEEE, IPCC, lots of different things, and all well, very well-meaning people, you know, with internet pages and working groups and everything else. And um, I was, was uh, uh, and I looked at it and I thought, actually, interestingly, of all these standards, we use none of them. Um, so I came to the conclusion that I suspect, at least in the first iteration of IoT, and, and I'm thinking of the analogy with the internet, you know, how did HTTP, you know, that kind of protocol uh, thing, and, and to some degree, the standards are set at the wrong level, in, in, do you know what I mean? Uh, they try and be too prescriptive about data and devices, whereas actually, I think, I think one of the great things about HTTP is that it is very general and generic, uh, do you know what I mean? And so, when, we, when I work with the mining companies in particular, I say to them, let's build, um, let's build a standard that's essentially HTTP-like, all right, and not build a standard, but let's go out there and publish something and say, if you want to sell me something, generate this standard. And now, I'll, it is early days, and I've got a few companies on board, but in the end, if the whole industry ends up doing that, all right, then it will lower the bar to entry for everyone, and that will end up being the standard. So I'm beginning to realise that I don't think, you know, standards bodies are actually really going to drive this. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? So the whole myth of internet part of Internet of Things, I think actually will be in the first instance probably driven by industry itself, okay? That is the applications side of things. I think what worries me a little bit is then that you're not going to be able to take a device that works in one industry, let's say transport, and move it into the mining industry, which is another one, or put it into health, which is a third, um, because everyone's going to be running different things. But I, like it, all industry, this has to go around a big loop, do you know? Uh, um, I think we have to learn by doing. Does that make sense? That's not a very satisfactory answer, but there's no, I don't think the industry is mature enough yet to accept a standard. Do you know what I mean? Time for one more. Yes, in the front row. That'll have to be the last. Oh, I'll, all right, Patricia, I'll let you be the last. But this, let this gentleman first here. Yeah? <coughs> if you could keep your answer and question short because we are compressed for time. Sorry. Oh, question and answer short. Sorry. No, sorry. So, uh, uh, very simple. <laughs> Uh, a very ultra simple uh, comment on uh, uh, what we've just uh, seen you present. Can you see anything, any end uh, to the com increasing complexity to what you've presented? Um, looking into the future, long after I've gone, or everybody here has gone, uh, uh, there seems to be um, a, a total absence of uh, the human, uh, humanity. Um, I don't know if that uh, says anything to, to you, but I, I'm on about the uh, increasing complexity. Is there any end to it? Finished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably not. Want me to keep it short? Yeah, uh. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a very good question. <laughs> so is that it? Sorry, is that it? Probably not. <laughs> Are you, I could, or I could spend half an hour no, discussing no, it. No, we better not. Yeah, yeah. But it's a very good question and comment, and hopefully today we'll learn, do a bit yeah. more of that. Um, Patricia, for last word to you for this session. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Patricia, at Chatham House. Um, I was very interested in your separation between privacy and security, mm. um, and I really liked what you said about privacy, but could we look a little bit at security, because mm -hmm. security is obviously an important part of the Internet of Things. And... Um, I would like to sort of build on Laura's question and ask you about the drivers for security within the Internet of Things and the way that you've seen it 
within the industrial Internet of Things and how that might transfer across to the more domestic sphere of in the Internet of Things. Cool. Hard in two, one minute. Uh, yeah, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably unqualified to comment on that, truthfully, despite being in defence. Uh, you, know, uh, there, you know, there are lots of ways of doing security. I will say I'm also a big fan of formal methods to prove uh, correctness of systems like this. And we, I used to run a very big program uh, doing that for embedded devices. And I think that's more likely to be the future of security than, you know, simply the way that we deal with it at the moment. Um, but it's just, I'm probably not qualified to say about it. I think privacy is the biggest challenge for IoT, not security, though. Okay, we'll leave it there because we have panels on all these topics today. Um, fantastic scene setter, Hugh, and it's fabulous to have you in such an important position in the UK. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.